Σα καλωσορίζω όλου στο σημερινό σεμινάριο. Θα γυρίσουμε στα αγγλικά τώρα για την περίπτωση που συνδεθεί κάποιο από το εξωτερικό. Welcome everybody to the today's seminar. As you see, the last uh, seminars have to do with quantum physics. It is uh, obvious that uh, this line of research uh, flourishes in uh, the research center for astronomy. Uh, today, it is a kind of an internal seminar in the sense that uh, Yanis Kondopoulos will be giving the talk. Quantum interference, reality, or an illusion of the detector. If, thank you, Panos. <laughs> Obviously, this is not a subject that I know well. This is uh, something that I, I worked on during the days of the lockdown in the last two years. And uh, we stopped coming to the center for to our work every day. And I will try, so it's something that I, I don't know very well, the subject that I don't know very well, but has uh, really preoccupied me for, for, uh, for some time, for a few years. And the last two years, it became kind of a, of a, a some kind of obsession in some sense. Uh, those who know me even better, like Christoph Miopoulos, know that I'm not, I'm very far from being an expert in quantum mechanics. So I'm going to talk about uh, basic ideas, basic, uh, basic issues, and a way that we thought uh, that may, may, let's say, give a different interpretation of quantum mechanics. This is all very experimental for the moment. I'm going to show you uh, near the end some results which are interesting but it's uh, very far from being a complete theory and a complete understanding of even the things I'm going to, to, to talk about. So the subject is quantum interference. It's interference, interference effects with uh, single particles. The title was proposed by uh, a member of our center, Christos Efimiopoulos. Uh, so he thought that uh, we should give an exciting title. title. Well, uh, in reality, the title of the two papers that we submitted that are currently in under consideration is much more, uh, uh, let's say, restrict, uh, restrained interference with non-interacting photons, one paper, the other is with non-interacting massive stochastic particles and the special type of detector. Uh, so, as I said, these are, these are ideas that preoccupied me for the last two years or so. But uh, we, I really needed the assistance of uh, Thanasis Demos, who did most of the calculations in the second paper, which are the exciting calculations. As you, you will see, the results are exciting. And I put the name of my father in parentheses because he still does not want to, to be part of this, but we may in the end convince him. He, he really participated from the sidelines to guide us and to offer his opinion. And I hope in the end he will be part of the final publication when that comes. So what is, what is our problem? Uh, the problem is this uh, uh, duality between particles and, uh, and waves. So one of the basic things uh, one learns from in quantum mechanics is this uh, wave experiment, this interference experiment. We have a source of light and uh, that light uh, goes to a screen and there are two holes in that screen. So uh, if we see light as a wave, like the waves uh, in the surface of the sea, or like the electromagnetic wave that we know, uh, we learned in university for, for electromagnetism, then if I have one, one uh, slit open, one hole open, then that wave goes through that hole and expands that way. And I observe this distribution. If I open the other hole, then I observe the distribution. If I open both holes and the holes have a certain size of the size of the wavelength of the radiation, then I observe something different. I observe constructive and destructive interference bands of a lot of radiation, uh, dark and uh, bright bands. Now, the problem is that if I go to the picture of quantum mechanics and I say, well, in reality, that wave is not a real wave, it is particles, then I would expect particles adding up and giving me something like this continuous bright region. So these particles don't interact one with the other. Quantum mechanics does not tell us that one photon knows about the existence of the other photon. They're independent one after the other. 
And it is very natural to expect that if I only have particles, I have a distribution like this mid middle, this particle theory distribution. But what I observe with photons and with electrons and other particles is a an interference pattern. So I, 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 I'm trying to, say, uh, to understand this problem. Are, is nature con consisting of particles or of waves? Uh, by the way, when I tried to explain that to my children, my, my son said, well, uh, sea waves consist of particles. So what is different now? Well, the difference there, I think, is that the, the, the molecules of water in, in the surface of the sea, they, they communicate, they have some, some interaction with each other, it's like a membrane, like a continuous sheet, and they interact and they form this wave. Now we're talking about independent particles. So there have been many, many exper experiments. This is one I found from 2014. And we see here uh, in the vertical scale are the different detectors. This, these guys, they, they, they have a light source, a laser source, and they have 28 detectors. And they detect the photons that arrive there one after the other. The, each measurement, the horizontal scale is time, each measurement differ from the previous one by something like 100 milliseconds, a few milliseconds. So each photon, each detection is independent of the other one. So this is how the, detect, the, 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 the photons arrive in the different detec detectors. And you can, by eye, you can see that there are bands where you have many photons and band, many detections and bands where you have no detection or few detections. And this is the wave uh, structure. Uh, same ex similar experiments have been done with with particles independent particles so you have a you have a, a screen there you see how it's filled up with single electron detections and after a few thousands uh, particles you see a clear pattern that is consistent with quantum mechanics okay. so what is the problem that preoccupied everybody and, and including myself uh, the problem is the following. What are these fields, this, this part? Are they particles or are they waves? And quantum mechanics tells us that if we're not looking at the process, the particles are waves. They, they behave like waves. Whenever we're looking at the particles, we see particles. I, I think that this is, I don't know, it's like a game. Someone is, is playing games with us. And, they describe that as the collapse of the wave function. We cannot see a wave, the, the wave disappears. And it, when I was preparing this talk, it reminded me when I was in kindergarten, my father was dressed up as Santa Claus and came to our house from the balcony. And, I, and when he left, Santa Claus left, I wanted to see Santa Claus. I wanted to see this, this particle. So I, uh, well, my parents, they held me back, my mother, my father, went out and my, my mother held me back. And when eventually she let me go out, I, I went out to see the particle and there was no Santa Claus had left, had just so snow outside. So the quantum mechanics, I see like, the, it, it's to me like the inverse Santa Claus effect. You want to see the particle, the, the wave, you don't see the wave, you see the particle. Anyway. What really intrigues me is that those particles, they behave, they are well behaved. Quantum mechanics talks about action at a distance, and we have one part of the experiment that is here, the other one has left very far away. When I measure one part, that gives some action at a very far distance. But if you really go and you check, is there any information that travels between those particles? Nothing. These particles are very well behaved. Nothing travels fast, faster than light. Cause causality is not, is not, uh, uh, does not break down. So to me, it means that the fields are particles. Uh, so this is a double slit experiment. And quantum, classical quantum mechanics tells us that I have a wave from the left. I'm not allowed even to draw where the particles are, but I have a screen somewhere here and I measure uh, areas that have a lot of part, lot of detections and fewer detection. What is important for quantum mechanics is the wave function. And this comes from a solution of the so-called Schrodinger equation. And what the wave function gives us, it gives us some amplitude and some phase. The, the phase I think you will see for me is very, very important. There is some phase. And the amplitude, what, uh, classical 
quantum mechanics tells us that I, I have a, a complex function, I obtain the complex function, then I take the amplitude of that and I square it. So the, the thing that is measurable and is important for us is the amplitude, that square, new of, uh, square root of n, which is the density of particles on my screen. And this is how I obtain this uh, interference pattern. It seems like th that the phase is not important. So that's all I need to know about this field. This is what uh, classical quantum mechanics tells us. Well, some people insist, and people in our group here, in, a, in our center here, insist that no, they are particles. They are really particles. And this is the Bohmian uh, view of the same problem. It is that the, the, in reality, have particles that flow through the two slits, and they travel along well-defined trajectories. And the game here, but how do I obtain these trajectories? Well, I obtain these trajectories having first solved the Schrodinger equation. So even Bohmian trajectories, they start from the Schrodinger equation and from the wave function. They start from this, then I'm, as I said, I'm not an expert in Bohmian, but I think that there is something which is the momentum operator. And if you take the real part of that and you divide by M, you get something like a velocity and trust me that this expression here divided by m and by psi and take the imaginary part of it, it's like, like a real velocity. Now, the interesting thing, and this is the velocity that the Bohmian particles flow, flow, uh, follow when uh, the, we perform this Bohmian uh, trajectory experiment. And in that velocity, as you see, the phase now becomes very important. But this is a, uh, it's not a different picture. It's equivalent to classical uh, quantum mechanics. I, I, I don't know if it teaches us anything new. They, the particles just don't follow straight lines like the photons. They follow these very complicated trajectories. And from this expression here, one can, I think, inverse it that way. So that phase is the integral of the momentum along the trajectory of the particle from the source to the point of detection, something like that. So after all these years and all these experiments, the observation that interference patterns are built one by one, one by event by event, quoting Richard Feynman, he said that this observation that we have interference with individual particles, this is, I, I'm going to read it, impossible, absolutely impossible to explain in any classical way and has in it the heart of quantum mechanics. I agree that it has the heart of quantum mechanics and I will offer uh, an explanation that maybe uh, will uh, maybe will convince someone that it is possible to, to obtain interference with event by event uh, uh, detections. So what if there is no problem of having waves and particles? What if particles are particles? And those particles are well, well behaved and they could very well follow classical orbits. Well, that, that may not be exactly like that. The new element, so you, you may reverse the, 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 the Santa Claus problem. Uh, particles are particles. And whenever we're looking at the particles, we see waves in this, in, in, in what sense? The, looking at the particle, we see again, we see particles, but those particles are distributed in a certain way. What if that distribution is what we see and we interpret it as a way? It's the reverse of the previous picture of quantum mechanics. Particles are particles. This is our proposition here. Particles are particles. They behave classically. They follow the, norm, the laws of Newton and Einstein and uh, special and general relativity. I, I don't know, I'm, I don't want to go that far. But what if when we decide to look at the particles and collect a large number of them and then we'll ask how are these particles distributed? What if then we see waves? So in order to, to, to have that, you need some uh, uh, some uh, cooperation between the particles and the detector. 
So the particles must carry some information like that phase we had, we had before. So a particle like I, 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 I'm giving here an interpretation of the double slit experiment according to this idea. Again, particles, photons, for example, here, go through the slits, they move classically along straight lines and reach the, uh, the screen at the end. So they are distributed, let's say, uniformly after they cross the, street, uh, the, the screen, uh, the, the, the two holes. So you get particles, as you see, from hole one everywhere. And you get particles from hole two everywhere. So you get particles even at the position of the so-called deconstructive uh, interference, even at the positions that you do not observe anything, even their particles arise, photons arise there. So what is the new element? Why does the detector see light, darkness, light, darkness like this? But particles have arrived everywhere, classically. And the proposition that we make here is that every particle has something like an internal clock, has something, some carry some information. That information as I put at index J, meaning that each particles follow a different or orbit, a different trajectory. So it's J is the trajectory of each particle that the particle follow to get from the slits to the screen at the detection point. And that trajectory is just the integral of, uh, as we said before, of mv over h bar times uh, the length along the trajectory. And that expression is one over uh, lambda de Broglie. So is dl over the length scale of the lambda of the particle. It is very interesting that for photons, the wavelength of the photon does not involve the Planck uh, Planck's uh, constant. The wavelength is a, is a property of the electromagnetic wave. I don't know how the particle knows about that property. I don't know that, but it is a property of classical electro electromagnetism. And that expression here is just the length of the trajectory of the photon divided by the wavelength of the radiation. Somehow the photon knows about the wavelength. But you can have this picture with classical photons without any mention whatsoever of quantum mechanics. When we put particles in with mass in the second part of the talk, then mass, the Planck uh, constant is, becomes important. So one thing that we need is that the particle carries some information. So what type of information is that? I don't know. I, I'm not going to, it's more like a mathematical proposition what I, I'm going to talk here today about. It's not a real model, but I have a, a picture in my mind, which is a football that uh, Cristiano Ronaldo hits very, with, uh, hits the football. So if you hit a football, a football is not a point. If football has some size, can, the football can have internal degrees of freedom. So imagine the particle is like a football. And when you say that I, send, I am going to send a particle to do this, to perform this experiment and go through the holes, it means that somehow you gave a kick to the particle. If you give a kick to the football, the football starts wobbling. And Thanasis here tells me this wobbling has very interesting uh, implications about the trajectory of, of the football in, in, in the soccer game. I'm not going to play soccer here with, uh, with those particles, but at least I'm going to argue that probably these so-called elementary particles, when they move and when someone sets them off in motion, they start wobbling and they start counting with some kind of internal clock that carries with it this phase S that I show in the first line here. Well, if it's part, each particle has this phase, then each particle will come at the collection point on my screen. And now I need the second element of this proposition that I need a special type of detector. So my detector, for example, let's go to this, this destructive uh, in, uh, interference point. My detector collects all the particles that arrive at that position. And for some reason, I decide to divide the, the square root of that number and play this game for all directions. So particles come from hole one and from hole two. And the detector collects 
all these particles, collect their phases, and their phases, as I said, depend on the length of each trajectory, add them up according to a certain prescription. It's a mathematical expression. I have no idea how this may be implemented in nature. Take that, take the amplitude, square it, and that will be the number that the detector announces of the particles that it has detected. Or in other words, I have a position, a detection position, my particles come and my detector collects those particles. Each one has this clock, this, this information about the trajectory. My detector collects N particles, does the processing of the phases and announces that in that detection position, I collected N bar particles, not N. It's my decision to, 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 to say how many particles I announce. So if these particles came, all of them with the same phase, I count N, I announce N. If those particles came from different trajectories and the phases had the phase difference of phi, so one comes and counts as one, the other counts as minus one, one minus one, in the end, I, I may announce that no particle was detected in that position. Particles were arrived there, like this box here, it's filled of particles, and yet the detector may announce, no, I didn't measure any particle. I measured very few, or at least less than what arrived. If that, uh, let's say, game, if we, we, play, we can play this game, and we can indeed play this game with little children, we can give each one a clock, and let them walk, and then they arrive at a certain position, and I ask the clock, give me the clocks, so I, I add the, the time measurements according to that prescription, and I get, I announce how many uh, clocks I received uh, uh, with that prescription. If I do that, and if I show examples with that, where, where that works, then this is what I mean, that particles are particles, particles behave classically, and yet the detector decides and announces a different number from what it really receives. And that number, that distribution of the number may have wave characteristics. So it's like, uh, for example, uh, like, uh, like an illusion in some sense. Uh, so the same thing once again, quantum mechanics says that the fields are waves. The waves arrive at the detector, the detector collapses these waves into particles and announces that the particles have the distribution that the wave tells us. Bohmian mechanics says, okay, uh, particles are particles, but they follow a wavy potential. They follow these wavy trajectories. And at the end, I detect particles one by one, but those particles have followed the wavy trajectories that the previous picture had. Uh, implemented due to quantum to, to the wave function. The picture we have here is, is different. We have classical particles, one after the other, but the detector needs to detect many particles from different directions. So collects particle at each detection position. And the new element here is that those particles carry some information about that trajectory. The detector, after collecting the particles, uh, uh, works on the phases and processes the phases and then announces, I detected that amount, that number of particles. The announcement may be different from the particles that really arrived at the detector. Uh, unfortunately for us, I don't know if you can see this, uh, all ideas have been thought by other people. And it's not a question, well, it looks unfortunate, but after going through the literature, we found a, a paper by this Japanese group where the title is Corpuscular Model of Two Beam Interference and Double Slit Experiments with Single Photons. And they do exactly the same thing, the same thing in principle. The, the photons carry some information. It's very different from what we propose here. And the detector processes that information, information in a very different way from what we uh, propose here. But the essence is exactly the same. 
They're classical particles and they have to collaborate. They carry some information and they have to collaborate with the detector that slowly builds up the distribution that the quantum mechanics uh, problem has, uh, has obtained. So I have to be honest, this is not a new idea. I looked up the work of that group. I didn't see any follow-up work on that work. And as I said, it is very, it, it looks like more like a Markov process. Uh, they have some prescription about how to change the wave function. And the more particles you add, the better the agreement with quantum mechanics. But it is very different from our proposition and it doesn't have this phase that the Bohmian, um, uh, the, 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 the wave function has and the Bohmian formulation has. So it, it is based on something different. But nevertheless, I, I'm going to continue with our work. So the first paper that we submitted has to do with, with uh, photons, two slits, photons and the photons move on straight lines. They move out from the slits and they come on the screen. And I place 28 detectors. I try to, to reproduce a particular experiment that was done with those photons. It was done with 28 detection points. And uh, if I have it correctly, or maybe, I don't know, the, the black line is what I expect and the blue, uh, the blue bars are the histogram of where those photons were detected, or, or not detected, announced by the, by the detector, by the, the 28 detection position. So if I didn't have any phase information, the distribution will look more like this one, uh, 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 this 1000 here. So they're more or less uniformly distributed among the detection positions. But if I play the game that each photon carries a phase and I add those phase in that way, you see that slowly, slowly, I start building up exactly the, the expression that uh, quantum mechanics or the classical, that's a classical interference experiment for, for photons electro, of electromagnetism. It's not quantum mechanics really. But I get this pattern here after, after about 10,000 detections, I get this pattern here. So, uh, there was a comparison of this actual experiment by, uh, by a certain group to check the theory of, of the Japanese group, to check the model of uh, Jean et al. And the issue was not whether the model of individual particles was able to reproduce the pattern. We too can reproduce the pattern, the, uh, the wave pattern. That was not the issue in that paper. The issue was how fast we were able to reproduce the pattern. And we were as fast as the Japanese group, which is not as fast as the actual experiment. Nature somehow built the pattern faster. And then we checked and we saw that in the experiment, it, it said very clearly that the experimental, uh, the experiment, the, the detector has a detection um, probability of 5%. 5% meaning my interpretation is that out of 10, uh, of a hundred photons that, are, that leave the source and get to the detector, only one, only five are counted. So we count 20 times less we announce 20 times less photons than the number of photons that really made it to the screen. That number is used nowhere in the interpretation of the experiment. If I include that number, then the rate, how fast we build the interference pattern according to our model, into the genital model is the same or very close at least, same order of magnitude as the time scale it takes to build up the, the, the the actual experiment. Uh, so uh, if now I, 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 I we start talking about massive particles, massive particles are, are different. Uh, okay, I, I will get into more details. I don't know if the details I'm going to talk now are so important. And massive particles, up to now we said that particles follow classical trajectories, and like the photons move from the from the from the holes, they, they move straight along straight lines to the screen. But 
If I have class, if I have massive particles, then you might say, well, let them also follow classical trajectories and play this game. Let them follow the trajectories and then, uh, and then collect them on the detector and play this game of adding the phases and processing the phases and then announcing the number of particles. But here I have a problem because we know that there are quantum effects that cannot be explained with classical trajectories. One of them is quantum tunneling. I have a classical particle with, with a certain amount of energy and sees a wall. And the wall is higher than the energy, than the height that the particle can jump. And yet it manages to, to cross the wall. So uh, in quantum mechanics, even if those particles existed, they do not follow exactly classical trajectories. Another problem that I spend a lot of time thinking about, and we're going to, I hope we're going to address it again with uh, more carefully with the uh, FAMASIS is the hydrogen atom. If I have particles uh, on Keplerian orbits around, uh, around the nucleus, like planets around the sun, and those particles have a certain energy, like the energy, for example, of, the, of a certain state of the hydrogen atom, that particle on a classical Keplerian orbit cannot move infinitely far from the nucleus. You cannot do that with a finite amount of classical energy for that planet, for that particle. And yet the wave function of the hydrogen atom has terms like E to the minus R over some R uh, characteristic. So the wave functions of, uh, of the hydrogen atom, they extend all the way to infinity. This is impossible with classical particles. So we are missing something. And then at that, uh, I discussed it with Dimos Kazanas and it seems that what we're missing It seems that what we are missing is a stochastic a stochastic process. So again, this is not new. This is something that was proposed by Nelson in uh, 1966. And the idea is that particles in nature, they follow the classical trajectories. If you see at the lower uh, part here, uh, you see that they have some acceleration and they follow some force. There is some force on them, some classical force, but there is another process that also acts on the particles. So the particles move with some velocity v for some time dt. And after every time step, the particles feel a stochastic process, a so-called Wiener process, and that they get a key, a kick dw. So not only they follow the classical trajectories, but they also get kicks, random kicks, which have a certain distribution. The average of the kick is zero. The dispersion of the kicks, the, the, the amplitude somehow of the kicks goes some, something like the square root of the time interval, delta t, square root of that. So this is a Wiener process. People are experts on that. Uh, I, I am not. And doing that, Nelson proved that if particles follow trajectories that are perturbed by this stochastic kicking, let's say, then the, the function that is formed uh, then if we have the density of the, of, the, of the distribution of those classical particles and the phase as defined previously, the integral of mv over h bar times the, the length along the trajectory, that expression here, which can be obtained by these uh, random stochastic trajectories, that expression is a solution of Schrodinger's, Schrodinger's equation. So one might say that quantum mechanics and stochastic mechanics are equivalent. I don't think they're equivalent. I haven't really seen any interference um, coming out of stochastic mechanics. And this is what we're going to, to show today. So we said, why not try to really run a stochastic experiment with those stochastic particles that Nelson Assumed. So the motion, so we're talking about free particles. There's no potential, there's no force on the particle. X is the, uh, that's a, a 1D, pro, 1D problem. The, the, the particles move along X with time and they feel some acceleration, which is due to the stochastic kicks. That 
uh, arrives in a repetitive relation. So the next position of the particle is the pro previous plus the two kicks during the two previous time steps. And they start at a certain position X naught and they start with an initial velocity V naught. The problem is that even at the first time step, the, the velocity of the particle is not V naught because at the first time step, the particle also feels a stochastic kick. Our, nevertheless, we insist that at the first time step, T equals zero, it starts a certain position. At the first time step, it moves along a certain velocity that we choose and the, the values are V naught equals one, these are our units. And at the same time, it feels another kick. So the initial velocity also is, is, is rather random. Let's see what this experiment gives us. These are classical particles. The, the new element that is that they feel those kicks. Uh, I'm, I ju I'm just going to go to the end of this presentation. I'm not sure that the stochastic kicks are, are, are a really a central part of, of what we are talking about here. But nevertheless, we, we put the stochastic kicks. The first thing that was very, uh, let's say like a, we were well, like an astonishment is we start at this position. This is now an X T plot as, at that position. And this dashed line is the line. Uh, if the particle follow the, the initial velocity V not, they would move along that line. And now they, they do random walks around that line. And you see that the particles very quickly forget about the initial velocity that they have. They move, they move backwards here. They move faster, slower. They, they follow random walks. Yet the whole distribution of those particles, if I send one after the other independently under those random Wiener kicks, random kicks, Wiener and random, I think it's the same thing, then they follow a stochastic, a, a random walk, all of these particles, and the distribution of particles kind of follows the average velocity of V naught that we started with. So the particle does not remember the initial velocity, the distribution does. The particle has forgotten where it started and how fast it went there. The distribution not remembers that. Well, slowly, slowly it starts forgetting it. And if you remember the spread of the random walk around the average position, the spread of the random walk uh, increases as the square root of time, not as time. It's the square root of the number of, of random steps. That's why a photon that is emitted from the center of the sun, of the sun needs two seconds to reach the surface. And yet a real photon to get to the surface takes one million years because of these random, random, random uh, walks. So uh, uh, what we, I, I honestly did not expect, I, I, we, one would expect that the, this Random walk just expands around the, the, the initial position and completely forgets about the initial velocity. And yet the random walk moves with the average velocity. None of these particles, no one remember the average velocity and yet the, the distribution or the, the, or the detector that detects them, this is the, the gray area there, the detector sees that those particles, that, that expanding distribution remembers that it started off with the same velocity. This was quite unexpected. Yeah, 10, this is Experience. only 10,000. The experiments we're going to show you are with 2 million. The green, the green this is just 10,000 particles. If you put more, that's going to be much wider, I guess, but uh, these are 10,000. And these are the plots you're going to see till the end of the plot. You're going to see a series of plots like this. X is the direction of motion. And the vertical scale is just the distribution. We're just doing statistics here. So we start with the delta function of particles at t equals zero. All of them start at x equals minus 20. And they move with velocity one to the right. And as I said, they, we, we put two million particles here, two million, two million particles, you put two million particles here. They start moving around. This is one million, sorry, sorry. One million particles here. They perform this random walk. And yet the distribution remembers that it started off with velocity one, moves to the right, the peaks of that, those colored curves, they move at speed one very consistently, very speed equals one. You see at 
equals 40, it has a reached position 20, starting from minus 20, it covered distance 20, and the spread of the distribution increases as the square root of the time, exactly as expected for only. Now let's do the same thing. Now each particle has its own phase. Well, now we count particles with phases. You see what we're counting is not N, it's N with this bar on top of it, which may be different. It may be different at different positions, but there is a very, very good agreement that the number of particles with phases is, very, is the same and follows the distribution if I have no phases. So nothing, nothing special, nothing new here. Almost identical. Almost identical. One million of the number was again, roughly one million more or less. Not exactly the same. We may lose particles in a certain position because the phases may cancel out, but they are almost identical. How about now, but the subject of the talk was interference. How about two particles? One starting at minus 20, the other start at 20. One moves with velocity plus one to the right. The other distribution moves with velocity minus one to the right. I repeat, these are independent particles. No particle interacts with any other particle. No particle knows about any other particle. These are 2 million independent experiments with Python, numerical experiments. Each one follows a completely independent random walk following the Wiener process proposed by uh, Nielsen, the new element here is that we also have the phase. If we don't have the phase, we get the previous picture just added up with the second particle. So blue, orange, green, then you see in the red region, the two uh, distributions overlap. So that's why it's higher. And then they move, they separate again, they move to the right or the left. Now let's add the phases on those particles. If we add the phases, we see interference. So the particles reach, the distribution of particles is this, and what the detector announces is this. It is different from what the detector collected. So it announces positions where I have more particles than detected and positions where I have destructive interference. I have less particles or some cases may also tell, tell us that it has zero particles. So this is an example of interference with individual, classical particles that follow the stochastic trajectories, carry their phase, and we have a special detector that announces interference. So at that point, we became very excited and we said, does that solve the Schrodinger equation? Can that be an alternative picture for uh, quantum mechanics for the Schrodinger equation? And immediately, uh, so let's look at the Schrodinger equation. We have here, an equation for the, the free particle, one dimensional, no potential, V equals zero. And there are several solutions in the literature of waves, infinite waves, but there's a solution of wave packet. This comes from Wikipedia and from every other source you can uh, think of. And the solution for the, of the one dimensional Schrodinger equation is some expression looks complex, has this I, it's complex, of course, and h bar over m and v naught is one. You're not going to see this here, in the Schrodinger equation, so these are one. And it's a complex expression. So it looks like a Gaussian, but I don't know what this is. Well, we can take the amplitude of that expression, square it, and see now how does the distribution look like. And the distribution is a Gaussian center that moves to the right, the center of the Gaussian, the peak of the Gaussian moves to the right with time with a constant velocity one, so the peak moves uh, with time. But what is important is the width of the Gaussian, this part here. The width of the Gaussian in this solution expands proportionally to time. The square root of t squared is t. So immediately we see that this expression here is not what we obtain with Nielsen's random walk. The random walk expands at the square root of t, the solution that we have here expands as t. And this, has, this led us to think that probably the initial conditions of that wave packet are very different from the initial conditions of, of, of the random walk experiment. In our first experiment, all particles started at the same position and all of them moved with the same velocity to the right and also to the left from the other position. 
that gives you a spread as square root of t. How can you accommodate a spread that goes as t? Well, it is very natural to assume that probably I need different initial conditions in this problem. And what is mo more natural than to think that the initial conditions is that I have a spread of velocities in my initial problem. If I have a spread of velocities, some particles move faster, some slower, some even go to the left, then it is natural that if on average each part each, each particle on average follows the average velocity and I have a spread of velocities, then the width of that, dis that distribution is going to expand linearly with time. It is very, very natural. So we decided to change, to run another experiment. And instead of having all of them running with the same velocity, have them with a spread of velocity. Now they don't start exactly at the same position because even the initial wave packet has some spread and they don't start with the same velocity. I have an average velocity, which is one, and a spread of velocities plus or minus around that average value, which is plus or minus one. So one and plus or minus one around. We also did another correction, which we don't understand. And it is this expression here. The actual solution of Schrodinger equations has some phase part here, x plus 20 minus t to the half. If you remember, you don't remember because I didn't insist on that. If you remember, if you paid attention, the phase, the expression for the phase has a similar expression, but it had 2x minus t. Here, the Schrodinger equation has, the solution has x minus t half. So we decided that we two were going to half take one half of that phase we had before instead of two pi we're using pi we don't know why that's what we did and in order not to show again equations we did the same thing for a second wave packet second wave packet starts at another position at, this starts at minus 20 this starts at plus 20 the solution of the second wave packet is where you can easily get it from the literature and if you add one wave packet and another wave packet in quantum mechanics, and those are, and is called them, tangled. I, as I said, I'm very far from that terminology. I'm really scared to use it. But yes, the wave packet moving to the right is tangled with the wave packet moving to the left. So I have to take this one over square root of two before adding them. And then I get the correct expression. Let's, let's see now how the new experiment compares with the solution of quantum mechanics. So now this is the new experiment. It's one particle. It's one, uh, it's a distribution of a million particles, sorry, that start at the same position, but with a spread of velocities. And indeed it moves to the right at velocity one. And indeed it spreads linearly with time. So this is a good point. We didn't have that in the random walk. Now let's put phases. If we put phases in, we get the same thing, but there's a caveat here. Because now the phases are so mixed up because of the initial velocities, they, they cancel. A lot of phases are canceled. So the distribution of the detections is the same. You see, they're almost indistinguishable, the two distribution, distributions. Yet if you count the number of particles that are measured in the second experiment, it is not the same as what I, in, I, I sent in uh, from the initial position. So I, I'm somehow, for some reason, losing particles here, but their distributions are exactly the same. If I have phase, if I don't have phase. And now is the tricky part, which is the, the let's say, the, uh, the result of this talk. If I have two distributions, if I have two distributions, one going to the left, one going to the right, I just have the addition of the two. If I don't have the phases, they spread linearly with time. One goes on top to the other, and then they separate. And now, if I include the phases, I get an interference pattern. I had an interference pattern before. I have an interference pattern now, but now I am going to compare it with the solution of quantum. And here's the solution. Again, the, the number of particles I, we lost, like 30% of the particles are lost here. I don't know why we lose particles. I, I don't have an explanation. I, I have an idea, but I don't have an explanation. And this is the comparison with quantum mechanics. So obviously at, at time t equals one, 
we have a different distribution of the blue curves from quantum mechanics. So our initial conditions are not quite there. We have to improve on the initial conditions. But those distributions, the solid line and the blue line, they both move as they are supposed to move. They move to the left and to the right. And let's see, at time t equals five, they start approaching each other and they start interfering. Black line is the quantum mechanical result. Blue is the experimental results of one million particles moving to the right and one million particles moving to the left. T equals 10. They look very close, not quite. As I said, we still don't have a perfect agreement. T equals 10, we reproduce. This was completely unexpected. We have no idea how this, uh, this expression here, this complex expression, adding wave packet to the right, wave packet to the left, taking the square, dividing the square root of two. This complex expression, one is complex, the other is complex. We have no idea how the, the amplitude square of that expression is going to behave. And this is what we get. Time equals 10, I showed that. Time equals 20, they're very close. Time equals 30, they're sort of indistinguishable. Time equals 40, again, they slightly, they're not quite, we're not quite there yet. But we have something that at least looks promising. And I am going to finish here. Even the last line is, even if we don't offer anything new to physics, maybe we are very close to having a new numerical method for solving the Schrodinger equation. But did we learn anything? First thing, we never challenged quantum mechanics. We never said quantum mechanics doesn't work. We, we, we just left quantum mechanics <laughs> at the library and start, tried something different. So if our result is different from quantum mechanics, we have to correct our result and not quantum mechanics. But we try to offer an, an interpretation. It's not particles and waves and collapse of the wave function. It's classical particles. And the detector tells us that what we see is quantum mechanical is like waves. And you might say, well, it's a problem of the detector. Well, uh, the only thing I can say is that uh, I am short-sighted and I use glasses. So yeah, if everybody, most of us in the science were short-sighted and the only thing we see about the world, world is what I'm seeing now. If that were the only thing I could tell about the world, what my eyes provide, then that would be a very blurred picture that is far from the reality. If everybody was short-sighted as I am or colon blind or blind or anything, then the image we have uh, uh, for the world is what our detectors provide us with. If our detectors provide us with this wavy picture of nature, of this quantum mechanical picture, then quantum mechanics is just an image. Uh, the idea that we offer may be tested experimentally. If I'm going to, going to elaborate very much. Uh, if we detect photons one by one, and if we, okay, I'm going to show you. If we detect photons one by one and we stay at one position, then between those red lines, then slowly each pixel in that position remembers the previous photons and the previous photons and starts uh, forming the statistics and at the end announce the number of particles after many detectors. What if every time I have a detection, I change detector? What if I move my experiment in front of, of, the, of the screen? What if I were able to do 1 million different experiments on 1 million different machines, detect one photon from each one, and then come together with one photon, put them together? In that case, I would have eliminated the memory of the detector and in that case, and I think it's, it's an experiment that is doable. So I'm doing the interference experiment and this, the screen just moves, moves. So every detection is in a different position of the screen. And in the end, I take all the detections and I count them. And then I see if each particle alone knows about the wave function. That's what quantum mechanics says. This is not what we see. And I think this can be done. And the, so, the only the problem of our method is that we're losing particles. Sometimes more, sometimes less, sometimes we don't lose any particles. And I'm just wondering what if this is related to dark matter, something that quantum mechanics doesn't understand. Maybe there are more particles out there than the ones that we can detect with our particles. 
but I leave it to this and thank you for your attention. So, uh, Janis, thank you very much for this uh, really very interesting talk, very interesting subject. There is some time for questions. Also, first we're gonna ask uh, the audience here. Let me ask something that, uh, if I understand correctly, in the real two-slit experiment, there are no zones of avoidance. Wherever you go, there will be some measurement at a certain point. Yes. Really? Uh, yes, that's what I understand. And, yeah. And then something else. Uh, you spoke about uh, random kicks or stochastic kicks, something like that. Could be just uh, some some complexity in there, something that. Uh, what, what, what do you mean? Complexity? complexity. It's like having, uh, for instance, uh, in what we do in classical uh, mechanics, that we have chaotic uh, zones, chaotic behavior, which is not random, yes, it's very complex. Okay. Uh, the, tra the trajectory is going to be classical, even chaotic classical. Yeah. It, it will follow the classical trajectory. If the trajectory is chaotic, it will follow the chaotic trajectory. This is a force acting on the particle. It's, it's, it is included in the formula. What I'm talking about is on top of that, on top of there's you some need random, some random, it's random over, over a certain type. It's a binner okay. process. This is what Nelson proposed. This is what Nelson proposed. So if there is some question from the audience first here. Yeah, call this go ahead. By inserting stuff. Loud, loud, she's so all come closer. Uh, by using the winner process, we try to model a noisy process. Every quantum loud, system. Loud. Every quantum system. Uh, every quantum system is open. And by saying that it's open, it is always it always exchanges information and energy with its environment. Okay. Now we here, here we try to study Schrodinger's equation. Schrodinger's equation is a model for closed quantum system. But Nelson uh, tells us that okay, uh, anyway, the evolution is always noisy, and by doing so, uh, we can uh, model the environment, which always has an impact on the evolution of the system. Something, uh, something else that I want to make a comment uh, on is that by changing, by changing the spread of the velocities in the last experiment, we tried to come closer to Heisenberg uncertainty. This was the problem uh, in the first, uh, in, in all our, particles at the same all, position. All particles at the same position and all starting at with the, the velocity, velocity at the same velocity. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, yes, yes. so it was expected from a quantum uh, standpoint that we would not uh, be able to get the um, Schrodinger uh, results. Mm. So by opening the velocities, by making a zone, okay, we, we came closer to Heisenberg uncertainty. And maybe this is a conjecture, I, I don't know, it's my hypothesis, that if we, if we try to, to find the best approximation to Heisenberg uncertainty, mm. okay, by Changing our we'll, velocity will have better. We'll have even better results. Okay, better fit with uh, yes, with a, so with a, with, a, with the standard quantum mechanics. Okay, okay. so uh, please, uh, if there is someone else who wants to to ask something, uh, I don't see any any hand. Yes, yes, uh, a short question. Thank you very much, uh, Jan. It was very inspiring. Um, I was thinking if you could um, accommodate um, the entanglement effects um, in this scheme. So, for instance, you know, if uh, a particle breaks into two and uh, they, they are somehow, they have somehow some communication. So, when they come to the distance, you measure one property and the other one depends on the first one. So I was thinking if this could fit in this uh, yes, in the picture yeah. of particles with phase. This is very natural to, to implement in, in the following mm -hmm. sense. The particles that we, we, uh, we let's say, uh, interfered with uh, in this last experiment, they all started at, at that position, <laughs> uh, their respective positions with the same phase. 
So if the phase, the initial phase were random, we would not get anything. Mm -hmm. So somehow those particles know that they start at the same time at the same phase. So same thing. If I have an experiment and I send one particle to the right and the other to the left with that process, each distribution, each particle will be connected with the other one and each distribution will, will uh, manifest quantum effects. But every particle with the other particle are connected classically. Yes, the answer is yes, I think we can do it. Yeah, yeah. all right, okay, thank you, Jan. Yeah. Uh, comment on that? Yeah. Uh, actually, by, by doing so, by taking uh, uh, the phases, certain values, we came to model um, in the best possible way the entangled um, state that we make uh, the comparison with. Okay, back in 2011, uh, Nelson, the father of stochastic quantum mechanics, um, published a paper, a review paper, about the accomplishments and the failures of uh, stochastic mechanics. And by, with the approach of stochastic mechanics, uh, it, is, it, is, has always, it has always been um, able, one has always been able to, to solve the Schrodinger equation. There are many papers about that. Um, the quantum spin, which is a, a purely quantum property of uh, uh, nature, um, can be approximated. But the only failure, according to Nelson, is that with stochastic mechanics, we cannot produce entanglement. However, uh, Schrodinger's equation is linear, and one uh, can use this fact in order to begin with a linear combination of states as we did here. So uh, back in the past, someone prepared this uh, state. And here we try to model it with non-interacting stochastic particles. It is, it, it, we are allowed to do so due to the linearity of the Schrodinger equation, but entanglement the production of entanglement, the production of entanglement, okay, and probably is, according to, to Nelson, is it's not feasible mm -hmm. by doing stochastic mechanics. However, if we try to take initially entangled state from a laboratory of, or theoretically speaking, we can do our simulations with classical particles. So maybe this is one, um, this is a, an advantage of this method because we compared it not with a single state but with a, not with a product state but with a, an entangled state and we you we found a very good agreement nothing okay. so uh now one is christos here i think can i well thank you we have discussed with yanis all the this idea several times. I will come back to a, a comment and I would like a comment on Yanis' side also on this. Well, you emphasize that the particles are classical particles and the, all the problem is in the detectors, let's say. But I would say, and I would like a comment on this, that from the moment, of, from the point, moment that you start adding a phase, to the particle. I mean, the, the particle is always assigned a certain phase or a quantity e to the i s that goes with it. And that s now, that phase is actually measurable. I mean, it's something measurable, not probably not its value, is not a classical magnitude in the sense of physical magnitudes, let's say, or observables. But it is at, at any, any way is felt by the detector. Let's call it this way. So, in what sense would we say that adding a phase or permanently to the particle is radically different from adding a wave function to it? I mean, I would say the proposal in as far as the nature of particles is concerned is not radically different from quantum mechanics in the sense that you do add a certain wave-like quantity to them. 
On the other hand, that's uh, can I can I comment on that? Sure. And then I will come. Uh, to that. Don't forget the second point. Uh, I think again. I, I disclaimer. I'm not an expert, but I think it is different. Probably also radically different, because this is a local quantity that has to do with the prehistory of that one particular classical yeah. particle. The wave function is something completely different. It solves the full problem, takes account of all the boundaries of the problem, it's a distributed problem, knows that there is another hole somewhere else, and uh, gives some information to the particle that has no way of knowing unless someone gave it the information, unless the particle was able to sample all of phase space. Now, the only thing the particle does, it keeps track of its own history. If it went through hole number one, that's the only thing that particle knows. It has no idea, doesn't know that there is a second hole. It's a classical particle that moves classically and hits, hits the detector. And I can do this experiment with real stopwatches that I can give to my children and let them run and take a stop, take and find any way to cross that uh, fence and go there and give me the, the stopwatch. Has no knowledge of a wave. That's my understanding. Uh, okay, I, I, I just say to this, not to make a, a complete conversation right now, but okay, just okay, one okay. comment on this, that this is yes. exactly, in my view at least, like the history's approach of, of uh, let's say, based on Feynman's path integral. So let's say the particle has a unique path, let's say, but every path is associated with a phase. So the phase is characteristic of the path. Let's call it this way. With, with that, but, I agree. Okay. Uh, I would like to emphasize the point you made. I mean, you just set it up on the air, I mean, just very quickly. But that's, for me, is probably the most interesting and intriguing aspect of all of that, uh, which is that you say, probably, as I understand your proposal is, we all are detectors somehow. I mean, human beings see things. And uh, that's only because the eye essentially behaves like a, let's say a particle detector, a photon detector or whatever. Uh, so you seriously seem to imply that we see way less than what there is. Is that the proposal? Uh, th that is a proposal in the sense it is a result of that game. We're playing a game here with Anasis. It's a game. I may have nothing, uh, it's acknowledged in the last sentence here, it may have nothing to do with reality, and if it's a game that works, then it's a method of solving the Schrodinger equation, if in the end it works. But if it has anything to do with the reality, that game told us, I will repeat what you just said, that we observe less than what there is out there. That's what this game tells us. Yes, indeed. Less than what is out there, yes. Okay, and a very last quick, quick last one. All your particles in the simulation start with phase zero at the hole. I mean, do you count the probability that the phases are randomly distributed already at the beginning of the experiment? I mean, why should you, they all be in if phase? You, if, if you put phase uh, pi, you will get a different, a uh, fixed uh, moving, move the. No, no, if, you, if every short, particle but, pa yeah, passing from a hole has a randomly chosen different My initial suspicion point. is that if you do that, you kill the interference. That's my suspicion. We haven't done it, but that's my suspicion, Chris. And why, what, how do you explain that they all come in phase? That the they beginning? are entangled, that they are born together, and I have no explanation. It's like, it's like the plane wave that reaches the two uh, slits with the same phase in, the, in that sense. I don't have an explanation for that. Like? Okay. So next question, Stam is here and wants to ask something. Let's go ahead. Yes, hello. Uh, let, let me just get this out of the way. Hi, thanks. Quite provoking talk. Um, what do, uh, focus on this on your sore point because I'm a bit confused because for the following reason you have this process that leads to particle statistics so you have essentially you do have a random process because in a deed so one would think that fine I have an average value and this average value is going to 
and I'm, my and my distribution is going to have fluctuations about the average value. Now, if I understood correctly the, the statement, the statement is that in fact you seem to have systematically uh, less particles in the detector than uh, expected. So I was just wondering how if, if you have a if you had a distribution, you, you would say that I have an average value and I have fluctuations, both sides are on the distribution. If you have something that is systematically less, something should be the reason for it. So I was just wondering in, the, in this framework, what would be the bias that would lead to systematically less particles instead of systematically more particles? Uh... As, as you understand, this is not a, a real, uh, sorry, uh, a real, uh, it's more, oh, 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 as I, I called it a game, and we're trying to see if it has any relation with reality. So I'm going to answer it uh, from, from, from the gamer part, sure. the, the one who, not from physics, I don't know any about physics. Well, it's the rules that matter, not the, not, not, not the, the physics. The rules, thing. exactly, exactly. Yeah. So, you so have, what are you the rules? Have, the rules is this expression for psi bar here, so I add the phases, uh, these expressions, uh, Christos called them phasors, and maybe that's the correct expression. As I said, I'm not an expert in the field, so maybe it's already taken that word phasor. Anyway, it's E to the phase, to that phase that is the history, the prehistory of the particle. And I am at a certain position, let's say where my cursor is, and I collect N K particles arriving from slit number one and another N J whatever particles arriving from slit, slit number two and I play this game. Sure. If, if I didn't have those phases, I would have the sum of unity I would have gotten here square root of NK, nothing else. Sure. And uh, now I have a problem from the other part, but let's forget the second summation. Anyway, it's, I don't understand it very well. I would have the square root of NK, let's say, Divide, no, I will have nk. Divide the square root of nk, I square it, I, I get nk. You get k. nk. Yeah. Now I don't seem to get nk. Why is that? Because I have two directions. I get nk from one, uh, square root of nk from one, square root of nk to the, from the other. Uh, that solves my problem. I, I really like the phases here because of course. if I have nk from one hole and nk from the other hole and they have opposite phases, I add them up, I get zero. And here, if I have, have NK from one hole and NK from the other hole with the same faces, I get two times the square root of NK. And if I square that, I get four. Well, sure, NK, because the total number of particles, the total number is going to be conserved. It's just, just a spatial exactly, distribution. Exactly, that will exactly. Change. The but, total number is going to be conserved. But in the details, it's not exactly like that it's no, not one position but, it, but it's but it's the bias that uh sort of confuses me because i would have thought that i would have an average value and i would have fluctuations on both sides of the average value now if the statement that is, is that correct. i have systematically less there is a problem there that is very correct very true uh, very true and uh, uh, when we do the experiment without the initial spreading velocities, all the particles start with the same velocity and we do the, all these experiments here that they start at the same position or at two different positions, we seem to conserve the number of particles. And in those, even in this interference, we see the, uh, exactly as you said, the fluctuation above the number. It's, it's a small it fluctuation. Should be, it should be both above, above and below. Above and below. Sure. When we introduced the spread of velocities, we lost, we're losing, now we're losing particles like crazy. No, like so 30% here I, are lost. I think that there's some sort of something's going wrong there. That it can't be, there is a, because you can't have something that is systemat, if it's systematically less or systematically more, that means that there's a bias built into this uh, procedure and I'm just could wondering be, what that what that bias could be. Could be, could be. The only thing I'm going to say is that the way we calculate the phases, we uh, the phases, uh, the expression for the phases. Here is uh, the calculation of the phases. It's each particle has a trajectory, so it moves delta x uh, 
you know, I steps at time I, it has done I steps of delta X and the velocities, the kicks, anyway, you get that. So this is a calculation of every, of, of this phasor or that Christo said, of this phase of, of, and we get an answer. The answer is simple. If I have the same velocity, if I have the same velocity, I get a, a, a very simple expression. Even for this random process, I get a simple expression and I have the same velocity. If I do the same experiment, but each particle, when it starts, it can have a, a random initial velocity around the average velocity. Then in that case, I, I'm losing part. Well, then you should average over the velocities as well. I am adding everything up. Sure, but it, you know, if you have a if you have random velocities too, there is a distribution. There's there there's an averaging with respect to the velocities. I, I I'm not doing any averaging anywhere. I'm adding everything up. I'm adding everything sure, up. Sure, but uh, may, maybe you're right. No, maybe doing a summation for each velocity. Well, you know, you have since you do it for a fi so so a fixed realization of the velocities, and then you have to average over the velocities, because of course, for any given velocity, you can get either way. But if you average over the velocities, then this, sh this bias should cancel out. That, that is your proposition. We honestly, we run many experiments with analysis and they're randomly generated. And yes. it was a systematic uh, depletion of particles. So it's not but that in that, some cases that, that that is that is that is an effect uh, it, that is not since it's not obvious from these equations that I'm just wondering whether a random number generator has some sort of bias. Okay. Okay. <laughs> we're going to check that. Thanks. Why not? Yeah, we're going to check that. Okay. 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 Thanks. Nice. Let's see if there is anyone else who wants to ask something. Okay. Then uh, we thank Yanis again and to everybody who participated in the questions. And uh, we will receive the announcement for our next seminar uh, the coming days. Thank you very much.